So welcome to Launching Products in Asia. This is a re-recording of a lecture I gave originally at Product School uh, in person. And what I wanted to do in re-recording this um, was to be able to share with everybody. And um, what we're going to look at today is how culture, language, and analytics all come together as you move towards product market fit in an overseas market. And in particular, we're looking at Asia. So um, a quick run through through the contents of what we're going to go through today. In part one, we're going to go through a definition of product market fit. In part two, we're going to have a look at how Asian markets have changed then and now and what that means for Western brands as they move into Asia. In part three, we're going to look at how to find markets and that includes considerations about metrics, including uh, per capita GDP and population numbers as you go through as you go through. Um, you know, country to country. In part four, we're going to look at how to find interviewees to craft your value proposition, and that includes looking at cultural nuances um, that you might want to take into account as you uh, do your user research um, in niching down your value proposition. In part five, we're going to look at analytics and um, crafting your feature set as you launch and build your first Asian MVP. And in part six, we're going to talk about growing your presence, including hiring and how to expand into adjacent markets once you've established a beachhead market in one particular Asian country. So um, I will talk to you guys at the end of this presentation and uh, enjoy. Part one, product market fit. So what is product market fit? Well, I think Mark Andreessen really puts it really, really well in his quote here. He says that, quote unquote, the customers are buying the product just as fast as you can make it, or usage is growing just as fast as you can add more servers. And I think this last sentence is important. Money from customers is piling up in your company checking account, right? That last sentence really sums things up when you have product market fit. Well, here's another way to look at product market fit. It's where your product, your UX, your feature set, and your value proposition lock into what the market needs in terms of the underserved needs of a specific segment of your target customer. Now, what I think a lot of people forget when they're looking at this model is what you need to do is continually iterate to get closer and closer and closer to a much more intimate level of product market fit. So it's not just you know doing something once and leaving it at that. It's continually changing, iterating, adjusting your position so that you meet the underserved needs of your target segment much, 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 much more intimately. So how do we get to product market fit? Well, I think here that Andy Reschlev, the co-founder of Benchmark Capital and Mullfront, does a really good job of explaining how we get there. And while it's not as structured as we might think, it's also not as unstructured as we might think. So he says here that, quote unquote, serendipity plays a role in finding product market fit, but the process to get to serendipity is incredibly consistent. So let's move on to the second part. Let's look at how Asia's changed then and now. And just look at the picture there. The top one there is of Shanghai in the late 80s, early 90s, and there really isn't much there across the river. If you look at the picture on the bottom, it's changed incredibly, right? Look at that fluorescence, that color and that density of these buildings. I mean, this is really sort of like Manhattan in Asia, basically. So let's jump into things. So let's look at Asia in the world economy. So the blue, if you focus on the blue section, we'll see that obviously China takes the largest chunk. Japan has a substantial chunk as well. Um, if you look at some of the other economies, Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaysia, those are you know smaller economies, but they're important in the sense that they, for many businesses, they are gateways into the rest of Asia. That's where they establish their operational headquarters. And that's where they do a lot of their hiring. And that's where the nerve center, the hub of where they operate is, right? And also, if you look at South Korea, Thailand, those are you know medium-sized economies as well. Now, let's have a look at the old model, okay? So what is the old model? It's where you rely as a Western brand, you rely on your brand, or the country of origin as a core part of your value proposition. But what's changed in the last two, three decades is, is it's become less and less effective. So for me, you know, my parents uh, recall that when they grew up in the 1950s and 1960s, Hong Kong, merely being a foreign brand was often enough to get people buying. And the question is why? Well, Western brands represented a multitude of qualities that were very difficult to find in domestic Asian brands. And 
They were, for example, things like quality, technological advancement, if you're, for example, um, looking into the first calculator, for example, reliability, order, safety, sturdiness, and other things. Okay, so let's have a look at this slide. So on the right-hand side, we see a very chaotic scene. So it's of a, what looks like to be a vegetable market or a fruit market in the Chinese Cantonese parts of Hong Kong. And you see it's, it's kind of run down. And if you look at the buildings, um, there's a lot of bamboo poles sticking out and, you know, laundry is hanging into, in the air to dry. So it's, it's a very sort of chaotic, unorganized, undisciplined scene. So if you look on the left-hand side, how does this affect the perceptions of people in terms of Western brands and Asian brands? So if you look at the picture on the left, look at those brands, Ford, Gilman Motors, Caltex, you know, and you look at the order, the structure, the cleanliness and the discipline of the picture on the left-hand side, and you can see very quickly how for people who grew up at a certain time and age in Asia, it really shaped the way that they looked at foreign brands and domestic brands. But as I mentioned, that's changing. So we're going to look at here now is what sort of brands or industries can continue to rely on their westernness or their foreignness as a brand. And a really good example is food safety, in particular infant milk powder. So in China, this is an article from a recent um, Quartz article. So in 2008, there was a massive, massive milk powder scandal where contaminated baby formula killed six babies and sickened about 300,000. That's right, 300K children. And so since then, 10 years, 11 years later on, parents in China still don't trust local domestic milk powder. And so 10 years on, brands that can represent food safety and reliability are much in demand. And in terms of food safety, the brand equity has accrued primarily to North American, Australian, and New Zealand brands. So they have great reputations for hormone-free milk, for example, or hormone-free uh, meat. And in terms of baby powder, North American and Australian and New Zealand brands are particularly prized for what is perceived to be, you know, the highest level of safety. And you see here Chinese parents buying up, you know, these foreign brands of baby powder. So another type of industry or brands that can rely on their own foreignness is luxury with a history. And often these are European brands. So for example, Bentley cars or certain really high-end Swiss watches or German watches. High-end luxury that has a history, right, that people can show off and tell people about and makes them feel part of something greater than themselves, right? A certain sort of lineage that they can't get from domestic brands that themselves are, are very young. So luxury with a history. These type of companies can rely on their brand and the story that they've built up over what could have been centuries. So the question now is how to approach Asia as a Western brand, knowing that the Western model by itself doesn't work as well for most companies outside of you know, food and luxury with a history. So let's take a look at why else the old model doesn't work as well anymore. So you have now higher quality domestic competition. A lot of domestic companies put out great quality products that are reliable, that are sturdy and trustworthy. You have more developed economies in Asia now and hand in hand, they've been able to provide increased living standards, which mean increased uh, expectations as well. And consumers themselves are less easily impressed, right? They're richer now, they've experienced more travel, they've seen more of the world, they have more education and they have more expectations. Now, what you wanna do, no matter what type of company you are, no matter what type of industry you are in, you still want to emphasize the foreign origin of your brand. You really don't want to throw away or discount the brand equity you have as a Western or foreign company, because that sort of mind space that foreign brands have been able to occupy over you know, the last five, six, seven decades of just encapsulating quality, safety, sturdiness, reliability, technological advancement, that's still very much in the minds of Asian consumers. And that's something you want to emphasize, but not rely on completely and lean on so much that you completely discount the other factors such as price and local knowledge. And that's really important, local knowledge. So part three, how to find markets. So I like this quote a lot. It says that founders have to choose a market long before they have any idea whether they will reach product market fit. And this is from Chris Dixon, a partner at Andreessen Horowitz. So choosing a market that's right for you is just as important as having a great product. So let's look at choosing the market that's right for you. So as a first step, it's actually really useful to look at some analytics and in particular, the information that's available on the World Bank website. So 
I'm going to show you quickly what it looks like. So we are here at the World Bank Open Data website. And if you scroll down, um, you'll see that there's tons and tons of just great, rich, and super accurate, super in-depth information that's available for you free. So there's the Open Data Catalog, um, the Data Bank. We're going to have a quick look at the Open Data Catalog. So what you'll see is that all the information is organized by regions and countries. So here, Asia Pacific and East Asia, Europe, uh, Latin America. So there's tons and tons of information that you can use to, for example, look at GDP or per capita GDP. So for example, if you want to see if a country in general would be able to support a particular price point that you're thinking of, then you want to have a look and graph, for example, the per capita GDP of different countries, which I've done here. So if you look here, Singapore, China, uh, sorry, Hong Kong uh, and Japan and Korea, they're at the high end of the income spectrum in Asia. If we look at mainland China, Malaysia, Thailand, they seem to be sort of at about the same, the upper middle high, uh, upper middle income spectrum. If you look at Vietnam, then that's a slightly lower price point that they generally would be able to support. So what are some other things that you can look at in addition to per capita GDP as you're choosing a market that's right for you? So for example, you could look at population and that would give you an idea of particular sort of sales volume that a country might be able to support. And in relation to that, you could also look at internet penetration. So for example, because Asia is mobile first, a lot of sales actually happen over mobile devices. Then you also want to look at internet penetration in terms of being able to support a particular sort of sales volume. And another thing you could look at would be, for example, the return on investment for every dollar invested. And in that sense, then you would want to look at, for example, something like growth rates. And what you can do is what I've done here, put it into a graph or do some sort of analysis in Excel. So what you want to do here is to refine your market audit. So you want to make sure that your company has the capability or can develop the capability to take into account, for example, different languages. So, you know, as you can see here, there are over 2,200 languages spoken in Asia Pacific, which is more than anywhere else in the world. Um, another thing that you want to take into account is, for example, as I mentioned before, is it mobile first or is it desktop first? And increasingly in Asia, as I mentioned, it is mobile first. Another thing to really keep in mind is the types of payment options that are available for your product. Do you take credit card, which is still, you know, probably the most important payment option in North America? In Asia, it's a little bit different. Cash on delivery is popular. And for example, online payment through something like Alipay, which is like an Asian version of Apple Pay. That's very, very popular, particularly in Asia. You might also want to take into account predominant belief systems and customs. Um, if you're doing you know, if you have strictly business relationships with your partners and your customers, this doesn't really come into play that much, but it is something that you want to keep in mind, particularly as you go into um, certain business meetings um, that could explain certain things like certain types of body language, certain types of um, ways of acting, which we'll go into later in this presentation. And finally, very important, local regulations. So every country has their own set of laws and rules, and it would be very important for you to be able to understand uh, what they are, what not to contravene, and to consult the appropriate business and legal professionals who can give you an idea of what the sort of local rules are. So then now having done all of the previous analysis, what you want to then do is put this into a PEST or political factors, economic factors, social factors, technological factors, a PEST analysis. So for example, with the current trade war between the US and China, that would definitely go in political factors and probably economic factors as well. So you really want to classify the different types of considerations that you're you know, thinking of as you launch in a Asia market and put that into this type of analysis. There's another analysis that you can use as well. It's called PESL, where you add considerations in terms of legal and environmental factors as well. And that's also a very useful model to use as you rank and order the different things that you would need to take into account as you launch in Asia. So let's go into part four where we talk about how to find interviewees to craft your value proposition. How are we going to find people to talk to? So let's have a look here at Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon. And this is a kind of a, a little game that people used to play and I guess they still play it in terms of you know tracking how far an actor, how far removed they are from Kevin Bacon. So, you know, if you look here down at the bottom, you know, George Clooney is only one degree away from 
Kevin Bacon. You know, he they both worked with a actor called David Strathairn in a movie called The River Wild. So why do I bring this up? Well, the reason is in Asia, forget six degrees of separation, right? It's more like one or two in Asia. So what you'll see is that you'll run into the same people from your home base, it could be Hong Kong, it could be Singapore, and you run into them over and over and over again across the region, whether it's in Seoul, whether it's in Shanghai, whether it's in Taipei, you know, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, you'll keep running into the same people over and over again. And what you'll find is that people who you've never met actually know about you or they've heard about you. So it, relationships really pay in Asia, right? Because of this one or two degrees of separation, um, events you go to or people you meet in sort of social events, they potentially could become clients or business partners. And that's really something to keep in mind that um, when people say relationships matter, it matters much more in Asia, particularly when you're dealing with the same group of people over and over again, and they are very, very small and closely knit social and professional groups. And so what you can do in order to get that first batch of interviewees to really craft your value proposition is you can reach out from your home country to your customers or colleagues. They may already have an overseas network. So let's talk about how to find more people to talk to in order to gain localized knowledge, in order to get closer and closer to product market fit, and also to re further refine your value proposition. So in the last slide, we talked about how you can actually reach out from your home country through your network, your professional and your social network in order to locate people in the foreign country where you want to launch. Well, in this case, now we're actually starting from scratch in the Asian country having already landed and your boots are on the ground. So for example, a good place to start is chambers of commerce. So for example, the Canadian Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong, or for example, the American Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai or the Australian Chamber of Commerce. And what you'll find is that everybody is really clustered in a handful of groups, social groups, professional groups, events, and committees, right? For, so for example, it might be certain sort of charity events where you're gonna find a very closely knit community of expats and locals. And often these events and organizations are sponsored by companies with really well-known brands. So the Hong Kong Chamber of Commerce, for example, is sponsored by Bombardier and Air Canada. And what you'll find is as an English speaker, you get easy access to high level people with wide and influential networks that you otherwise would have found it very difficult to get access to in your home country. So by the virtue of you being a Western English speaker, it's super, super easy to get access to high level people who normally would be out of your reach. And there we go, right? So these are the, the points that I just spoke about. So it's a small world in Asia. So why do I say that? So in a way, being in Asia is almost like being in high school again, right? So with all the goods and the bads, but primarily it, I would say it's very good. And why is that? Well, the reason is that as we spoke about before, you often run into the same people over and over and over again in your home city or in, you know, when traveling abroad for work, for example, in another country, you find them in the airport, you bump, bump into them in a restaurant. And ultimately, it's very, very easy to build relationships with people as you run into them over and over again, and you see each other. And that allows you to build strong localized knowledge, but not only knowledge, you get access to strong localized and influential local connections, which allow you to branch off even further and compound that knowledge and those connections and to be able to reach wide and influential groups of customers who are willing to buy having already heard good things about you through their professional and social networks. So there we go. So now that you've gotten in touch with people, what are some of the ways to keep in touch with them and to keep an ongoing line of communication with them? So what you want to do is to make sure that you're using the right communication channels. So for example, in terms of chat apps, what's really popular in Hong Kong and China, for example, is WeChat. In Korea, you want to be using something called Kakao. In Taiwan and Japan, you want to be using something called Line. And WhatsApp is, I would say, broadly popular in Asia, although it is banned and blocked in China. So these are some of the things that you want to keep in mind. And just as a quick aside, um, BlackBerry Messenger was actually quite popular um, in Indonesia. That was their last stronghold. Um, so if you were working in Indonesia, what you wanted to use until it was, it was shut down um, in, in, in May of this year was BlackBerry Messenger. Now, this sort of localization in terms of using different platforms is true as you move into other areas as well. 
So for example, in Asia, Yelp doesn't have much of a presence. Um, what is popular, for example, in mainland China is something called Dianping, and in Hong Kong, something called Open Rice, which you would also want to keep in mind is has both a Chinese and English version, which has different content. So that's something you want to keep in mind as you launch in an overseas market where not only are the languages different, but sometimes the content between uh, different language versions of the same platform are different. So that's something to keep in mind. And so finally, maybe you're not using Twitter in Asia. Of course, Twitter is popular in certain parts of the continent. In mainland China, for example, you would want to use something called Weibo. So here, we'll talk about cultural awareness and in interviews when crafting your value proposition. So the first thing that we're going to talk about here is power distance. And what this really means is the degree of respect with which somebody in a higher power position is treated. And this power distance varies from culture to culture. So let me actually show you. So we look here and we see that Malaysia has, at least in this study, the highest power distance index. As we go down, we see China has you know, a, a fairly high uh, power distance index at 80. Um, not the highest, but still pretty high. Um, and pretty much a lot of the Asian countries, like Singapore, for example, here, um, Hong Kong is at 68. They have high power distance indexes, which means that people or employees tend to treat their uh, superiors with a large degree of deference. So their bosses, for example, or their managers. If we look to some of the North American cultures here, for example, the US, their power distance is relatively low at 40. Um, some of the other Western countries, Germany here at 35, and finally the UK at 35, as well as New Zealand at 22. So that's something to keep in mind when you're doing your interviews in order to craft your value proposition and to refine it. Okay, so having looked at power distance index, let's go back to the slides. So what we see here with individualism and collectivism, I think a great way to sum that up is with the first picture there on the top. So the blue, that represents Western cultures. I think with us, we tend to maybe perhaps not prioritize the individual, but we certainly don't ignore the individual. And we put enough emphasis on the individual self that we feel like a lot of our goals can be achieved through our own efforts. Whereas on the other hand, if you look at the red with collectivism, there is the expression in Japanese, the nail that sticks out gets the hammer. You compare it to the Western expression, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. With collectivism, goals are put in the context of the greater community. And there's an emphasis on working together towards a common goal as a community. And finally, we look at neutral versus effective communities. So with neutral cultures, there is a lot less, um, I guess you could say, sort of emotional expression, whereas an effective society would have much more emotional expression. So these might come in the form of wider, sort of larger space taken up in terms of body language, in terms of uh, when you're walking down the street, and it includes things like touch, so how much you touch the other person. So generally in Asia, um, the countries there tend to be more neutral, and that's something to keep in mind as you do your meetings when you're refining your value proposition. Just be aware of how much touch you're, you're doing in terms of meetings, and also your body language. You sort of moderate and control your body language a little bit. So with all that being said, what we looked at in the last slide, how does it actually play out in terms of meetings to do user research to refine your value proposition? So we're going to look at it in, from the lens of body language, speaking, customs and we're also going to look at something quite interesting and these are personas that are rarely encountered in North America but which are common in Asia and which you might want to keep in mind as you do your user research and you go out and you attend your meetings. So let's have a look specifically at body language. So as I mentioned before body language in Asia is generally more restrained than in Western countries. So how does that actually play out in the real world? So for example, if you're giving a handshake or taking a handshake, generally speaking, handshakes tend to be a little bit more gentle and there's less pressure applied in Asia. And from my experience traveling around the continent, you know, Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaysia, that seems to be true, that handshakes are a little bit more gentle. And what is the right amount of pressure to apply? Well, you'll find out as you take more and more meetings and you'll get a sense of what is an appropriate level of pressure to apply in a handshake. 
Another example is when you're in a meeting. Do you put elbows on the table or do you not? Well, generally in Asia, people don't put their elbows on the table, particularly if there is a large sort of power uh, difference between the different people in the room. So if there's someone who is particularly senior, then most people generally will not put their elbows on the table and they'll have them by their sides. And that's just something that I've noticed, you know, in the time that I've spent in Asia. Another thing that you might want to keep in mind is the, I guess you could say, the restraint in facial emotions. So smiles may not be as open. And in fact, they generally tend to be more sort of like closed lipped smiles. And that's just something that you'll notice again as you spend more time in the region. And for those who themselves are Asian, like myself, what you'll find is people will have certain expectations based on your appearance. So you'll need to adapt. And what I tend to do is I slowly will introduce my identity as a part Westerner, somebody who's bicultural. I don't put it all up front at once, but what I tend to do and what I suggest for people who themselves are bicultural Asian is to slowly introduce that Western identity step by step rather than all in one step. And by doing so, you'll be able to reap the benefits of being both Asian and Western at the same time. And so now we look at speaking. So one thing that you want to do is when you're speaking to somebody whose first language is not English, what you want to do is you want to speak sufficiently slow and you want to use appropriately simple diction. So you want to sort of pitch your diction, your vocabulary at the right level so that they can understand what you're saying. And I find that often somebody who's new to the region, they'll actually speak as if they're still speaking English in their native or in their home country. And there's a lot lost in translation. So it's not just uh, the vocabulary level. It's also things like idioms and that sort of thing. You really want to watch and control the, the, the amount of vernacular that you're using if you're speaking to somebody whose first language is not English. And finally, using the appropriate level of formality, especially true in Asia, where instead of immediately addressing somebody as, hey, Bob, hey, 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 John, hey, Mary, you want to start off with, hey, hi, Mr. Chan, or hi, Miss Wong. And that's just paying the level of respect appropriate to the culture. And that's something to keep in mind as you spend time in the region. So next, we'll take a look at customs in Asia. So the first one here is the formality of clothing. So what I've found is in Asia, there's a slightly higher level of formality expected from your clothing, especially if it's a first meeting with, let's say, a client or somebody who you're meeting for user research. So in Western countries, I think it's perfectly acceptable, particularly if you're working at a startup, to maybe wear something that would be, let's say, a sort of casual college shirt, that sort of thing. In Asia, you want to be a little bit more formal than that. You might want to dress it up a little bit with a blazer, at least to get started. So there is a higher level of formality in Asia, and that's something to be aware of. The next thing is receiving business cards. So if you look at the pictures up on the right hand side, the picture at the top is receiving the business card with two hands, um, which is what you want to be doing in Asia rather than with one hand. So that's uh, if you give and take a business card with one hand, then that signifies a, a level of disrespect and you definitely don't want to be doing that. You want to be using both hands to accept and receive the business card. When you've received the business card, what I do is I tend to take a pause to look at the card to sort of silently acknowledge that I've received the card and of course the other person will be able to sense that that I've taken a pause and acknowledge the business card. I know it sounds a little bit strange but um, business card receiving and taking does have a level of formality that you won't find in, in a Western culture. And finally organizing business cards. So this is a little trick I learned when I worked in a law firm. So what people will tend to do, generally I've found, is they'll take business cards and arrange it vertically. So what that tends to do is sometimes a person who is more senior, their business card would end up underneath somebody who is more junior to them. And I would say most people don't have this problem, but some people do. And so what I tend to do is arrange the business cards horizontally so that I don't run into the problem of hierarchy, right? So the business card of somebody who's more junior is never on top of somebody who is more senior. So if you put it horizontally, you completely avoid that problem. And that's just a little trick I learned. So what we're going to look at now are personas which are rarely encountered in North America, but which are common in Asia. And amongst these are, for example, what are called domestic helpers in Asia. And basically these are live-in servants in working primarily in Hong Kong, Singapore, also China. Uh, and they're recruited from overseas, so places like the Philippines and Indonesia. The next group that you're going to 
probably encounter quite a bit is the expatriate, the expat, both the short-term and the long-term expat, usually um, working in high-end white-collar fields like finance or law or uh, management consulting, um, and they're there for, um, you know, usually a few years or, you know, if it's over the long term, then they're there living there in Asia for good. And the next persona that uh, you would probably encounter is what we call the international school kid. And this is an interesting persona because they basically sound like a somebody who grew up in the West. They speak with a native English accent, but there are small tells that let you know that they're um, what we call the international school kid. So they'll actually mix UK, for example, UK pronunciation with a North American accent. So it's quite interesting. And they'll also might be speaking with a North American accent, but use terms like mobile instead of cell phone or pavement instead of sidewalk. Those sort of little tells that let you know that they are somebody who grew up in Asia. They attended something called international school, which is private school. And although they speak with a native English accent, they probably don't see the world in the same way that you do if you grew up primarily in the West. So that's something to keep in mind. And for some of them, they might actually think in another language. So they might not actually be thinking in English. They might be thinking in, for example, Chinese or Korean. And that really affects how they see the world. And when you're doing your user interviews, you're going to have to adjust a little bit to take this into account. And so that even those who think in English, but who were born and raised in Asia, they'll see things a little bit differently than, for example, a Asian person who was raised in the West. So for example, a um, Canadian born Chinese or an American born Chinese. And that's just something to keep in mind as you do your user interviews and you um, meet people in Asia. And so the next thing to do after you've done your user interviews and your meetings and you're starting to craft that value proposition is to pick values that resonate with your audience. And so that you can see on the right hand side in the card advertisement that intergenerational dynamics and family really figure in Asian culture. And they've really, for this particular advertisement, really integrated that sentiment into it. On the left-hand side, you see an advertisement for Chopard, which is a Swiss luxury jeweler and watchmaker. And if you look closely at the picture, it really has hints of an aspirational lifestyle. You know, everything from obviously the watch and the jewelry, but also if you look at the clothing, the quality of clothing, the type of material it's made from, the, the leather glove, the makeup and the style of makeup, it really does take the consumer to an aspirational mindset of achieving and going to a, at least on a material level, a place that they're not there yet, but which gives them the hope of being able to achieve that and something to look forward to. So here's a great chart from the Nielsen Company, which basically lists out the different themes that resonate most clearly with different cultures around the world. So on the top right here, we see that family orientation in advertising, that resonates very, very strongly with people in Asia Pacific, which is the blue bar at 37%. Um, here below at the aspirational theme, you see again, it resonates with people in, and consumers in Asia Pacific. If we think back to the ad from the last slide, they employed who was arguably the number one or was the number one actress in China, Fan Bingbing. And uh, obviously, you know, they compounded that with the show part theme. Again, they are a luxury jeweler and watchmaker. If we look here, celebrity endorsements, again, as I mentioned before, you know, picking people like movie stars or athletes, people who are well known, that resonates quite well with people in Asia Pacific. And if you look over here in this last selection that I've picked, you see that sexual themes tend to have less resonance with Asia Pacific consumers. And I think that goes back to when we looked at different cultures in terms of neutrality and affectiveness, A-F-F-E-C-T-I-V-E. -E. Asian cultures tend to be more neutral. They are less affective. So they display less emotional or outward emotional displays. And so that could possibly explain why sexual themes in advertising resonate less with Asia Pacific consumers. Now we move into part five, interpreting analytics and crafting your feature set. So if we look on the right hand side, I think that pyramid there very nicely encapsulates what an MVP should be. It should be delightful, it should be usable, it should be reliable, it should be functional, but it should only really be a small slice to really do only what is necessary in order for you to meet the needs of the market, no more and no less, so that you can start learning and start iterating. So we're looking here at your Asia MVP, things that ultimately affect conversion. So what are some of these things? The first one is local buying power. 
So as we explained earlier, something like, for example, uh, per capita GDP, that would actually affect the ability of the population to be able to pay a certain price point. So what happens if you find that they're not able to pay the price point that you normally charge in your home market? So things that you can do are, for example, completely stripping out certain features, completely taking certain features out. What you can do also is you can break up your product into separate modules and sell them as individual components and in packages. What you can do is if you want, you can actually just sell the whole thing for less. So one thing that you would sell for, let's say $1,000, you're selling for $700 instead. And finally, when you're doing any sort of pricing considerations, also remember to factor in shipping costs if it's relevant, if you're selling a tangible product. Another thing to keep in mind is translation. So really important to not be penny wise and pound foolish. And here's a good example of a large company that actually neglected the importance of translation. Now this one here is actually uh, IKEA, IKEA United States. So when they launched this particular product of Workbench, very obvious, fart full, right? Very obvious, but they completely neglected that part of the equation, translation. The next thing to keep in mind is payment method. So what is the predominant and the preferred method of payment in the market that you're launching into? Is it, for example, cash on delivery? Is it credit card? Or increasingly in Asia, is it online payment through something like Alipay? Another thing to keep in mind is multi-currency. Does your website or your app support payment through the local currency, for example, Hong Kong dollars or Malaysian ringgit or Singaporean dollars? And that's quite important. Another thing to keep in mind are load times. So when you're launching in your home market in another province or in another state, usually load times aren't really much of a consideration, but they certainly are when you're launching overseas halfway around the world. And what you'll find is if you don't have servers that are located in the appropriate parts of the world to minimize the wait time, you'll find that your conversion will drop off quite dramatically because people are, you know, they're impatient. There's a lot of alternatives out there, a lot of substitutes, and they'll go to these substitute competitor products if you are not able to provide quick load times. And finally, another thing to keep in mind is the power of positioning. So the ability to breathe new life into a brand and completely put it into a different price point and a different market. And in the next slide, we're going to have a look at that. So does this look familiar to you? Certainly for me, when I was growing up, Pizza Hut wasn't exactly high-end refined dining. But what they've done in Asia is quite interesting, and we'll see this in the next slide. So in China, Pizza Huts repositioned themselves in a higher price-pointed market. So if you look at the decor, it's completely different from what you would see in North America. And their menu also is different than what you would find here. So for example, you find things like steak and wine and other sort of more high-end menu items that you wouldn't necessarily find in North America. And they've done a great job of repositioning themselves as not necessarily high-end, but certainly a nice sit-down restaurant that you wouldn't mind taking your family out to, to, for example, celebrate a, you know, a good grade on a report card or a high school graduation. There's certainly no shame in taking your family or your friends to Pizza Hut. It is in a completely different market than how they position themselves in their home markets of North America. So now let's have a look at using analytics to assess whether you're moving towards product market fit. Now there are a multitude of different metrics that you can use to assess whether fit is happening, but here are some metrics that I think are of particular importance to somebody who is launching outside their home market in the Asian market. The first one we see here is the language of the user session. And that's basically the language that was used by the user to visit your site or your app. Now, if you notice that these sessions in other languages experienced higher bounce rates, lower average pages visited, and a longer average session duration, and at the same time, assuming the copy or text you used on the page was different from what the user's main language is, this could indicate interpretation issues. In other words, the users were confused by what you wrote, or they just didn't understand your copy. And there we have it. The second one here is added to cart, but they didn't complete the purchase. And that could indicate problems with the lack of payment in a preferred currency. So for example, as we mentioned before, Thai bot, for example, or the Korean one. Or it could also indicate that the total price wasn't right for them. And when we look at total price, you want to make sure that you include shipping where applicable. The third metric that I encourage you to look at is dropouts at checkout. 
And this could indicate problems with payment options, for example, as we mentioned before, cash on delivery or Alipay, or it could indicate that, again, that the total price, including shipping, just wasn't right for your user. The next thing to keep in mind is the location of the session. Now, this one's a little bit difficult because this could mean a multitude of different things. It could indicate load speed issues or payment issues or any other issue, but at the very least, it's sort of like a canary in the mine. It indicates to you that something is up, something is wrong. And so finally, make sure that you're cross-checking each measure against other measures and that you're not using any one measure in isolation and that you're using it in concert with other measures. So we move into part six, growing your presence. So let's have a look at scaling and growth. There's really a couple of ways that you can go about this. You can go non-local or you can hire locally. So let's have a look at the first option, going non-local. If you do go non-local, there are generally a couple of ways you can go about this. The first is that you can work with partners. For example, partnering with distributors in another country. And the upside is that they can take care of the localization and the outreach at a potentially lower cost. And at the same time, they can tap into the local contacts. The downside is that you give up a degree of control and profit. The second way you can go non-local is you can run things directly from another office. So for example, your head office in Toronto or New York, for example. But this is potentially the riskiest option to take as you're running things via remote control and you really don't have people on the ground in the Asian market with local knowledge. Now let's have a look at the second option if you're hiring locally and staffing a local office. The thing to keep in mind in Asia is speed matters. You're competing for scarce talent who have the requisite job skills and also the required fluency in the required language or languages. Another thing to keep in mind is that hiring usually happens within days and usually within two weeks. So from the time that you see a person for the first interview to them formally signing papers to becoming an employee, that usually happens within two weeks. So if you're more used to the North American way of interviewing where it could take you know, a month or more, that's got to change while at the same time maintaining the quality of your hiring process. Everything's got to be much more compressed and much more rapid. Finally, be very careful with your language requirements. When you think fluency, are you thinking fluency with internal colleagues? Are you thinking fluency with partners? Or are you thinking fluency with clients? If it's fluency with clients, should they have enough fluency to sell using generative language rather than descriptive language? So in other words, what I mean by generative language is it's similar to being able to create your own shot in sports rather than having somebody pass you the ball at just the right time in order to score. So selling is generative language. When you're hiring for a position with certain foreign language requirements, be very aware of what type of fluency you need and test for it. Right? Find somebody local, maybe online even, who could actually test your candidate on their foreign language skills. So continuing scaling and growth, let's have a look at organizing markets by priority. My suggestion is that you organize markets by first tier, second tier, and third tier. So looking at first tier markets, this is where you would have a local physical office and also access to good local talent. It's usually in a place that also has good physical infrastructure, like internet, roads, consistent power and electricity, and also social institutions like the rule of law. And by the way, I say it's because these things are not consistent across Asia, which also explains why so many regional head offices of multinationals are in Singapore or Hong Kong. So these are some of the things that you want to look out for. And you can use this first tier market as a regional hub and potentially locate staff from your home office here to be able to run your operations across the continent of Asia. All right, so let's have a look at second tier markets. These are usually places where there are no or there is a limited local physical office. And in these places, you're usually working with partners. So for example, distributors, which we talked about in the last slide. These are markets where it's worth grabbing some market share, but not so much that it's critical to your company's growth, that it's worth going to the trouble of setting up a full-fledged office and all the attendant hiring and paperwork that would entail. And finally, third tier markets. These are good to keep in mind, but your focus should be on your first and second tier markets and doing well in these markets before moving on to the third tier. Finally, don't assume what worked in one market will automatically work in another. There's a misconception that Asia is a monolithic continent, but make sure you really understand the nuances between the different countries. I mean, of course, there is some level of transference where there is better compatibility between certain countries than others. For example, what works in Hong Kong could potentially work better in China, compared to Korea or Vietnam. Or, for example, what worked in Singapore 
would potentially work better in Malaysia compared to Thailand or Myanmar. And so that's it. A quick bird's eye view of the things to keep an eye out for when you're launching in Asia, from analytics to hiring to understanding the history and perception of Western brands in Asia to finding and, and conducting user interviews in order to fine tune your value proposition. Thank you for your time, and I hope this tour has been useful. So, hope you guys found this useful. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me, you can email me at richmanwong at gmail.com. Or you can visit my website at uh, richmanwong.com and you can add me on LinkedIn. And so, yeah, hope you guys found this useful and I will talk to you guys soon. Bye.